Hi, I'm Ali Jackson Jolly. I'm here with Syed Ali, who is a professor of sociology for um, Long Island University in Brooklyn, and he is also the author, co-author of a book called *The Peer Effect*, all about how your peers impact who you will become and um, who you are. Um, so, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So. The thing that caught one of the things that caught my eye as a parent is that um, when I got your email, um, the blurb that this all begins with says, "For decades, parents have asked their children, um, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you?" And the answer is, of course, duh, yes. <laughs> um, so, can you talk to me a little bit about? Um, you know, the peer effect, parent, to your point, parents have known about this forever. Um, but why do you think it's so important right now to think about this peer effect and the way um, some be bad, poor behaviors or poor choices or people who make poor choices um, can um, impact society at large? Sure. Uh, I think the one of the big issue problems is that we as parents and leaders in all realms right police chiefs and executives we we have this idea that we have control over our kids and over our, you know people who who work for us and you know like underneath us and it's it's not true like to a large degree like children I mean just talking about children for a moment they as soon as they hit daycare they're out of our out of our control and we like to think you know they'll do what we say but implicitly, as parents, we, we understand that's not true because we spend so much time worrying about who they're hanging out with and what school to send them to. And that's acknowledging that, in, like if, if we really had the power, we would tell them, do this, don't do that. And they would do this and wouldn't do that. Uh, but we know that they are going to do those, those things. And so we have an understanding, I, I think largely that among kids anyway that there is this peer effect but it's also true in other forms right it's true in the in the workplace so, i mean you look at google and they have this you know wonderful h you know hr department and great hr page and it looks so great and this is the google way and you know we have this google culture but the cultures are made among the people in the group so like you know in the schools you have the, the kids and the cliques and they have their own way of doing things and their own culture and the teachers and the administrators and parents all like to think we're going to make changes and they're going to do these things but unless the kids themselves are willing to do it you can say all you want and they're not going to it's not going to happen yeah so speaking about um, work culture um, and um, peer effect um, impacting how people behave. You mentioned something that really caught my attention, and that was some of the um, misdeeds that are happening in the banking industry, um, you know, that we're watching unfold in the news or have watched recently unfold. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing, you know, that comes to mind for me is, of course, the Sam Bankman Freed um, case that we've been watching. Um, could you explain to me? Um, how the peer effect may have been, um, you know, I guess um, part of what happened um, in terms of bankers mm. behaving poorly. Yeah, I mean, you look at what's happening with, with FTX and it looks, I mean, obviously I don't have, you know, privy info to inside, but from the outside it looks like you have these people who Right there, they came together at Effective Altruists and you know Jane Street trading and, and all that, and they have very similar ideas of how the world and how their you know crypto banking and stuff investing should should work, and they like they create their own they create their own norms within that within that firm of behavior, and they from you know the kind of testimony that we're, that we're seeing, like. I mean, Carolyn Ellison and Gary Wang, and like, like they've admitted that you know, in the end, we did wrong. But at the time, they were doing it. And they did it for like a long time, right? This kind of like I mean, alleged fraud that's that's been going on. But it was it was fine to them, right? Like this kind of norm of of doing those things, and 
you develop this kind of culture within a within a firm within an organization of you know these are what we, these are the things that we do these are things that we don't do and there are rewards and punishment for them and while you may have you know laws that regulate these things if the norms within a within that culture of the firm are such that it's going to allow that to happen it'll happen uh, Stephen Dimmick who's a, a this researcher wrote a in, really interesting article in the Harvard Business Review some years ago about Intra, uh, intra firm transfers and traders who had uh, investment bankers who had uh, like allegations of misconduct and it settled arbitrations against them. When they moved from one branch to another, the rate of misconduct among the people in the branch that received these these uh, investment bankers uh, went up 37 percent. And if they were people of the same ethnicity, which I mean, we're talking about banking, so we're talking white people, and <laughs> we're talking white men, mostly, that, that, that goes up almost double. So it's an increase of 75%, roughly, of misconduct. And that's, that's huge, right? And this is, this is, I mean, really, to me, this is the peer effect. It's like you're learning from your peers what's acceptable and what's not. Yeah, so um, I'm, thank you for bringing that up. I'm so glad you did um, because, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, DEI, how DEI can um, change, improve our newsroom, how um, different corporations are realizing that diversity of workforce um, is a benefit. But you did mention to me when we talked how um, DEI perhaps is not thought about enough in terms of um, this peer effect. And so would you would you share a little bit about what you mean when you say introducing the concept of more diversity mm -hmm. um, can mitigate um, some of this um, peer, the peer effect that you're talking about? Yeah, so when we talk about diversity in the workplace, it seems like it's it's mostly we're talking about diversity trainings, right? These like one or two hour like trainings here and there. And the research is really clear that these don't work at all. Like if your goal is to have a more diverse workforce, uh, diversity in management, just better behavior <laughs> overall, you're not going to get that through the, the trainings. Uh, Frank Dobbin, who's a researcher at Harvard, and his colleague Alexandra Caleb, they've done a lot of research on this. And what they found is that the things that really do work are affirmative action programs and like diversity committees and diversity positions and like just like really making an effort to recruit from diverse pools. So instead of just going to Harvard and Yale, you go to you know Howard and Fisk and places like that. And what they found was that when you have these, when you increase these positions, these diversity positions and affirmative action, you're more likely to well obviously make the hires but also retain the hires and and promote you know minority people into into management and the it seems that the mechanism here is that as you're changing personnel like it's one thing to change like hire one or two people in but if you're hiring them into a firm of 100 that's not going to make an impact on personnel it's going to make it, not going to make an impact on culture but if you hire say a dozen people then that's a big personnel change and that could in theory, lead to a cultural shift, right? So, like, while you know, even if management does nothing beyond hiring, right, the culture within the the firm at the lower levels will possibly change. Doesn't necessarily have to change, but it could very well change because of the shift in personnel. Okay, and then that disrupts this. Um, sometimes I think about it as an echo chamber or a peer effect. Um, because there's more um, more diverse professionals challenging the status quo or like why does that like if I take the idea of um, bringing in more professionals with mm -hmm. of diverse backgrounds whatever that diversity looks like um, to a corporation that is potentially mostly homogenous mm -hmm. all looks the same um, how can you just speak a little bit to how um, how exactly that you know taking your model of the pure mm -hmm. effect disrupts that uh, well for instance if you have a workplace that's largely male right you're gonna have a very bro culture yeah. and it's that's very common in you know banking finance and other places and if you introduce like larger numbers of women like 
a small number of women are just going to get harassed, but you're going to reach at some point a tipping point where it won't be okay anymore to make the, the kind of sexist comments or comments about cleavage or whatever. And so the, not necessarily, obviously, but it, it could, right? And it's enough, if enough women are there, you know, they they might say something. They might put their foot down and be like, this is not, a, this is not okay, yeah. right? And if you have, you know, more blacks and Latinos and, you know, other minorities coming in, maybe that mitigates, you know, the kind of racist comments and, yeah. you know, the attitudes and, and stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to, but it could it could very well. At the very least, you know, a lot of these things that were overt may become covert and may make the workplace a little bit more, you know, bearable for, for people. Yeah, and how about, is there a danger because, um, I think you look around in many industries and many places where you see behavior that many of us could sort of shake our head and say, you know, what's happening? Like um, from Capitol Hill um, and, you know, um, the new norm of politicians um, sort of like divesting themselves of um, polite rules of engagement or, you know, or even sometimes um, ethical and on honest rules of engagement to um, the crisis that we see happening on some college campuses with college age students, um, you know, going straight to what we would call um, aggressive, in some, in some cases criminal behavior. But is there a danger, do you think, of over um, over explaining some of this behavior by the peer effect. Do you think that it, it, when you look at those those examples I just gave you, do you mm. think, yeah, if they just mixed in some, you know, if they just empowered some other diverse um, viewpoints, or um, you know, had a, took out a couple of those poor actors, everything would go back to normal. Is there any danger into over indexing how much this is is? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to like go so far to say peers are the only thing uh, that matter, but I think there, there's, it's it's the other way. Like we don't look at peers nearly enough. I mean, like if we look at, I mean, you bring up you know Congress and then, you know the behavior of these guys, and this kind of goes back to the Tea Party, right? And they they brought in like this like they, all these new junior you know like Congress people came in with very similar ideas and, and similar, very combative attitudes and the kind of genteel discourse in a way of the, of the 80s gave way to, you know, this. And, and what we see today is just ramping that up even, even more. And, you know, and that was something like, you know, growing up, like you would never have seen that. Like no one would have done that, in, you know, on the, on the floor of, of Congress. And now it's like a, a regular everyday occurrence like nobody would have shouted at the president right in a in a thing so I, I think there is a, a, a peer effect there right there is this kind of echo chamber of people with their ideas and their and their attitudes and you see it playing out at the at the local levels too right at school board meetings where people just like angrily get up and, and like yelling in a way that they that they never would because they're with like other like-minded people like them. And then you see it in, in sometimes in voting patterns too. I mean, you look at a place like the Villages in Florida, right? This retirement, like really super large retirement community, really a city, it's over, like over 100,000 people live there. And it's like what something like 90% people voted for, voted for Trump, mm -hmm. right? It's, you mm -hmm. know, where, where do you find those, mm -hmm. those kinds of numbers? But I mean, you think about the structure of, of the Villages, it's, you know, middle, upper middle class, almost all white people who, you know, retired so they have a lot of time on their hands, play golf and tennis, and in between they're talking mm -hmm. politics and mm -hmm. watching, you know, Fox News and Breitbart and getting their information from the same places. And and also like this splintering of information into like different types of groups. I mean, growing up you had a handful of channels and a handful of newspapers and we agreed on the facts and we differed on interpretation, but now we can't even agree on the facts. Yeah. Alternate facts are being presented and that's and because we're not, I think, because we're, we're splintered into groups in a way that we weren't necessarily. I mean, we've always had groups, obviously, but the way that we receive and process information is through, like, these kind of peer groups in a way that it ne wasn't necessarily before. So, by, I think, I, let me see if I understand. So, it's that 
because in the news, for example, there's, I would say, I would argue more diversity of thought now because there's more access to blogs and med different kinds of media. Um, wow, I just dated myself by saying blogs, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, but I think what I'm understanding you're saying is that diversity is in a silo. So instead of it being, um, to, to think about your example of corporations where you bring in more women and more people of color that are all working together, this is like there may be more diversity, but they're not um, intermingling. Those like the, the, That it's just sort of siloed and that's what's making um, this peer effect magnified in the way um, people are consuming news is that am I understanding your argument correctly? Yes, I, I think that's that's right. And like we had silos before, but they weren't as strict, right? The the it, they were looser. Like you could come in and out of them more easily. Whereas I think now the silos are a little bit more more bounded, right? Like you're you're here and this is these are your people and this is what we talk about and this is how we live. And if you differ on certain things, like, you know, some things are not super important to, to people. It's like, well, you know, like maybe religion isn't that important to discussion, right? Differences between Protestants and Catholics or whatever. But, you know, things like, you know, your feelings about transgender kids, right? Like you can't be for transgender kids if you're in this silo, right? Or you can't say well, you know, I don't think transgender kids play in sports if you live in, if you're, you know, kind of exist in this silo over over here. So the, there's a more uniformity, I think. Okay, and so final question. Um, I'm a founder. I'm going to start a new um, tech business. I want to make sure that I protect myself and my new company about, uh, again, sorry, this pure effect. What do I do to make sure that I have my eye on the prize, that I am, that I am not allowing a bro culture mm -hmm. or some sort of culture that um, allows me not even to understand that I've crossed the line or uh, you know, I'm, I'm creating um, a culture in which people don't behave in the right way? I, I would think that you would have to be really careful about you're hiring at the first go, right? Like it's there's a tendency, especially in like higher status and like uh, where the stakes are higher, like money or you know, and to hire people like you, right? Lauren Rivera is a sociologist at, uh, in Chicago. She has done a lot of work on this, and she found that in these high status firms like banking and investment, that they hire people like them. So even like you're white, you're hiring white people like you, but even if you're hiring non-white people, they're still, they're elite educated, they played, you know, lacrosse or water polo or whatever, and so you're reproducing yourself, but you're also then reproducing that same kind of, same kind of culture. If you want really, if diversity for you is an important thing, you have to have, you can't just hire people from Harvard, right? You have to hire people from, from Howard and from you know, smaller state schools like North Carolina State or whatever. Well, it's not a small school, but you know, you know what I mean, like regional schools. And you know, there's talent everywhere, and you have to like, kind of like spread it, spread it out. Otherwise, you're going to reproduce, you know, these kinds of cultures that already existed, and it might not be the best thing, and you might end up like having what you didn't want to to begin with. But if you you know hire a very diverse uh, uh, workforce to begin with then you very possibly could end up with the kind of culture that you want. Yeah, great. Well, we're all out of time, um, but thank you so much for coming. And, um, you know, I'd like to, I'd love to invite you um, as you see more instances of the peer effect, particularly in the things that we cover, which is community and the intersection of community and um, industry, please reach out because I, I know that, um, I believe that there's a lot more space to talk about these important topics. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me.